Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Rachel Rennick. For those of you who don't know me, I am part of the Community Outreach and Education Program here at Perlmutter Cancer Center. And I thank you for joining us for our annual Lung Cancer Awareness Program that we host every November in recognition of Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Just a couple quick things before we get started. Um, if anyone needs to use the restroom, it's right down the hallway, so feel free to step out if you need to. Just a reminder to please turn your cell phones on silent or vibrate during the program. On your way in, you should have all received a bag of materials. Um, just a couple of quick things that I wanted to bring to your attention. I know some of you are probably already on our mailing list and you get our quarterly calendar of events in the mail, but if you don't, you're going to see inside your folder a little postcard that looks like this. The bottom portion is a mailing list sign-up portion. So if you would like to join our mailing list, just fill this out. You can tear it off and at the very end of the program, just leave it at the table outside and we will be happy to add you to our mailing list for all of our upcoming programs. Um, our fall programs are kind of winding down now. We have a couple more left for the fall, but our winter calendar is going to come out right after the holidays. So if you're on our list, you will receive that. Um, you're also going to see in your packet a couple of index cards. So if you have any questions for our speakers today, feel free to jot them down during the program, and I will come around at the very end, and we will take as many questions as time allow. Also inside of your packet, you're going to see a red ticket. That is your lunch ticket. So after the program, you can go outside. We are going to be serving everyone box lunches to go. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any seating area today, so they, we will be, have to go. So thank you for your understanding. And with that being said, we're going to get started with our program. You'll see the agenda for today, the schedule inside your packet. And I would like to introduce our first speaker who's going to kick us off and talk to us about interventional pulmonology. I would like to welcome Dr. Michaud, who is a pulmonologist and a cardiothoracic surgeon here at Perlmutter Cancer Center. Good morning, and thank you so much. I like get to be a repeat offender, so I came I was come back by like popular demand pretty impressive as a pulmonologist because you guys often see us at the very beginning and then don't see us for the rest of the course of your treatment unless you're actually one of my patients and I harass you. Um, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about all the many, many jobs that we do as pulmonologists throughout the care of people that have lung cancer. Because people sort of think of you as being their lung doctor at the very beginning and then we don't see you again. So let's talk about all the things that we can do. You know, we play a lot of roles. We're part of a multidisciplinary team, so we sit around a table every Friday morning and we talk about all of our cases. We actually all have input. So even on the backside of things, when you don't see what we actually do, we're still involved in your care and still making recommendations. Um, so, you know, what we know is that there is a recommendation that all patients should actually have a pulmonologist, and there's actually an official statement by the American Thoracic Society, which is our national society. You know, this is a slide that I put together uh, for last year's talk, but as you can see, I'm the director of the Lung Cancer Screening Program. Uh, we do a lot of early detection. We do, uh, we follow up on lung nodules, so people that go to the emergency room for other reasons, they have some chest pain, they get a CT scan, they find a nodule, so we're that group. We actually, as pulmonary doctors, are heavily involved in taking care of your lung health. So if you have underlying asthma, underlying COPD, if you have interstitial disease, if you have other lung problems, we have the ability to, to help you there. We also get involved with smoking, smoking cessation, and we have a direct pipeline with smoking cessation. Um, we do a lot of diagnostic procedures. So I do bronchoscopies, and I'm the chief of the interventional service, which means the interventional pulmonary is just all of the procedures that can be done in the in the airways, the lungs themselves, and then the space around the lung, the cavity called the pleura. So we're the docs that do all those procedures. Um, we also get involved when you need more tissue because you're going to have a change in your therapy. So we go back and we can resample and we can get tissue for your oncologist that, because one of the things that we forget is that over time, um, if your tumor persists, it can change. 
it it's sort of like it, the best analogy I have for it is it's sort of like a virus where you know you get a virus uh, or you get a, a bacteria we give it some antibiotics or some antivirals and it becomes smarter than us and it changes a little bit and it modifies to to no longer respond to that treatment and so you know this is kind of a new thing over the last five years where we go back and we look again and say does that tumor look the same as it did initially so that's called restaging or resampling. Um, we do a lot of symptom management. Patients come in with cough, shortness of breath. So once you're our patients, you're our patients for life. You always have a pulmonologist, and don't let those sneaky medical oncologists send you to somebody else. You know who your you know who your pulmonologist is. Go back to them, and when they say, "Oh, Doctor Refek is in the clinic," and you say, "No, Doctor Michaud is my, pa- my is my doctor," just remember that. Um, we get involved in a lot of kind of, can we get out to tumors? Can we do some, some, some treatments via the airways that are a little less invasive that can actually, that can actually um, sort of try to kill off the tumor locally? So we're getting involved in a lot of trials like that. We're also getting involved in a lot of trials that actually look at trying to give treatments directly into the tumor so that you don't get as many side effects from the, from the tumor, uh, from the treatment. So that is also happening. Um, let me see. Uh, I think that's probably most of the things that are on that slide. So, you know, why do you need a pulmonologist? Well, you know what? Here we are. These are the risk factors for the development of lung cancer. Certainly age, so age above 50 uh, is 65% versus 33% of, of patients that actually have lung cancer are less than 50. I suspect that that slide is going to be wrong in the next few years because we are seeing more and more young people. Now, I don't know if that's a New York bias, um, and I'll, we can talk about why I think there's a bias in New York in a couple minutes. Um, you know, smoking, it depends on the age and the quantity. So unfortunately, the cigarettes that you smoked when you were younger are a little bit more toxic than the cigarettes that you smoke when you're older. And the reason is, is that there's just more time for damage to have occurred from that. Um, but it always is important to stop smoking. Um, you know, we know that COPD, so if you have emphysema or chronic bronchitis, it's an independent risk factor for developing lung cancer. We also know the things that scar the lungs, like asbestos or pulmonary fibrosis, that you can actually develop lung cancers within those scars. Um, and then a lot of the medications that we give for other types of cancers, um, so get the immunosuppressives, can actually increase your risk of developing cancers. We're starting to know a lot more about the genetics of cancers, and I think we are just at the very beginning of understanding the genetics of cancers um, and whether you've had a prior cancer. So. As a screening, as a screening lady, uh, you, uh, you know, any rich people out there, I want a screening van. I'm looking for money for a screening van. I want to be able to drive my screening CT van around the city and go to high-risk people and make them go in my little van and check them out for, for lung cancer. So, so if you guys know any wealthy people that want to donate to my van, I'm all for it. So um, there was a very large study called the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial that came out in 2011. It included 54,000 people. And what they found is they looked at people that were 55 to, uh, 55 to 77, uh, asymptomatic, meaning they didn't have any symptoms to suggest that they had a cancer. They had smoked at least a pack a day for 30 years, and whatever rendition that is. So, you know, if you pop, smoked a half a pack for 60 years, that's still 30 pack years. Um, you, could, you had to either be a, smoke, a current smoker or had quit within 15 years. And you had to do all these other things, which I do in my office, which is shared decision-making. We talk about pros and cons for you specifically. Um, we have to actually say that we and, and actually do smoking cessation. We, so we, if you are a smoker, we have to counsel you on it. And we have to make sure that if you go through this program that you're actually going to follow through. So essentially, I'm going to skip over some kind of interesting things. So essentially what we do is these are the pros and the cons of screening. Essentially, we have a screening program here at NYU, uh, which was started when I came to NYU. Um, we are actually really rapidly growing. We're actually expanding to Brooklyn and also to, and Winthrop actually has their own program, but now we're all under the same umbrella and I'm the director of all of it. So we're trying to figure out how to actually do screening in all kinds of different populations, populations that are not necessarily English speaking. And, and actually, interestingly enough, patient populations where there's not a lot of uptake, where people who are at risk aren't even getting screened. So my big thing being a woman is women don't get screened. 
women don't get screened. Even if they meet the criteria, they don't get screened. And for me as a woman, I think that's terrible. And so we really need to actually get out there and, and help those women get on to screening. We're doing a lot of, of, of research uh, these days. So we're doing what we call endoscopic ablative techniques, where we use really cool technology like robots or GPS, and we go out really far into the lung if you have like one little lesion, but you don't have great lungs, and so taking you to the operating room is not great, or you have other reasons why you're not a good candidate for surgery. So we sneak out there, and we can actually either freeze the tumor or burn the tumor. Um, we're starting to do treatments where we actually put chemotherapy into the tumor, immunotherapy into the tumors. Um, and uh, I, saw, I saw my partner in crime for medical oncology somewhere. Ah, oh, there he is. There's Josh. Uh, he'll talk to you more about the treatments in a few minutes. But we're doing a lot of these technologies. So we are actually the first site uh, in North America to actually have what's called the ion robot. So it's actually one of the robots that actually is a sort of the height of technology. Um, it's kind of cool, actually. I'm not going to lie. I really should have brought up some pictures because I've done five cases in the last couple of weeks. So it's actually really fun. Um, and there's also some a lot of stuff about priming your tumor. So getting your tumor kind of ready to really react to the treatments. And so what we know is that, that things that actually get your immune system kind of ramped up will make immune therapies work better. So things like cold. And so this is why we're trying to think about freezing tumors and then starting treatment and try to see if we can get that tumor really to react a lot. So I do a lot of diagnosing of lung cancers. You know, it's really important to make the distinction between small cell and non-small cell. And it's, it's funny because when I started in medical school, like what now feels like, you know, the dark ages, um, you know, we talked about lung cancer and it was just really lung cancer. And then, and then towards the end of med school, we talked a little bit about small cell, non-small cell, but it's all bad, right? Like we, we kind of, kind of lumped it all together as not great. And then, you know, all of a sudden we started to break it down and we, st we started to realize that, wait a second, these are all the same. And so we kind of broke it down, broke it down, broke it down. You know, it's funny because I've been doing this for 20 years and what I tell patients today about their diagnoses and what's happening is so far different from what I told them 20 years ago. You know, I was kind of a pessimist 20 years ago. Now I don't even know what to say because, you know, I've been doing immune therapy trials since for now eight years. Um, I was one of the biggest recruiters to the early immune therapy trials. I was the person that got tissue for the immune therapy trials when they were just first getting started when I was working at Yale. And, you know, I have patients that are still alive from my immune therapy trials. So I don't know what to say, but the data certainly hasn't caught up. So, you know, I'm not a big encourager of looking at looking at numbers and the reason and, and looking at prognoses and things like that. And the reason that I'm not is because we don't know is the honest answer. The data hasn't caught up yet. You agree with that, right, Josh? So, you know, when we talk about lung cancers and how do we make diagnoses, the best way to make a diagnosis for a lung cancer is whatever gives you the most information with the least amount of invasiveness. We have to do the least to get the most. So we always want to try and look for the highest stage lesion, so the highest thing that's going to make you the highest stage of your cancer, and go after that first. And the reason we want to do that is because we can save you a bunch of other procedures. If we just stick a needle in something and say, hey, it's cancer, then we don't really know that much about your cancer. We don't know what to tell you, and we don't know how to treat you because the treatments are very different depending on the stage of disease. This is my partner, my very first partner. This is actually from 2004. Um, and this is actually a carcinoid for any of you that actually had a carcinoid. This is a carcinoid. Um, um, so that sort of just sort of says the same thing. I do a lot of fun plural procedures going to the space around the lung to make diagnoses. Um, we are actually one of the sites that does probably the most plural disease in the entire country. Um, and it's actually really helpful for patients because one of the things that can happen with later stage disease with lung cancer is you can get your chest cavity filling with fluid and, it, and your lung collapses down and you feel really uncomfortable. And it also pushes on the diaphragm so you feel really breathless. And so, but the thing is, is people used to just take the fluid away 
and they leave it. But the reality is, is that's a gold mine. That is such an important space for patients because to be able to drain, we can make a tiny little hole this big, put a camera in, take some tissue from there, and then use it for actually guiding your therapy. And you're at the hospital for 45 minutes. It's really easy. And so we've been doing a lot of those. And so we're sort of the leader in the field here at NYU for pleural disease. Um, you have a lot of stuff with solitary nodules, so nodules out on the side of the lung. You know, we really want to make sure that we're only doing the right things. And you know what? I think I'm going to go off of my slides and not show you any more slides. And the reason I'm going to go off of my slides is because I actually want to really talk to you guys. Um, and I really want to talk to you guys because there's a lot of stuff that happens as a cancer patient that the rest of the world doesn't understand. And it's really hard to be a cancer patient. Um, you know, I actually was diagnosed with cancer two years ago and went through two years of cancer care. I've had chemotherapy. I've had radiation. I've lost my hair. I've lost my nose hair. I've uh, lost 20 pounds in a week. Um, let's see, what other things? Uh, had complications. I've pretty much lived it all. There's not much. The only thing I haven't tried, I've not had immunotherapy. I will, I will be honest about that. I've never had immunotherapy, so I can't talk about that. But I, pardon me. Um, one of the one of the biggest things about it was that I actually realized that I was a huge hypocrite, and the reason I realized that is because I said some really stupid things to patients without realizing it. You know, when I was in medical school, they taught us that you need to actually look at patients in the face and talk to them. And you need to make sure that you're acknowledging that that they're responding and you're responding to them. So I used to say stupid things like, I understand. But what I was trying to tell you is I'm listening to you. But I didn't understand at all. I didn't understand until I walked a mile in the, in the shoes of my patients. You know, my two-year anniversary for having cancer was actually just this past week. And so I wrote a wrote a message to my friends and I said you know one of the greatest learnings that I ever had was walking them walking that walk and having to tell my children that I had cancer and having to actually try and figure out how do you get to chemotherapy and what drugs are they going to give you and can you drive home and you know I'm a single mom of two little kids so I've walked that walk and it's hard and it I think, I mean, Lila, who is going to, one of my patients, is going to talk in a little while. And, you know, one of my other patients actually just asked me, so were you the same before? Like, how were you before? And I, I don't know. I don't remember what kind of a doctor I was before. I can only assume that I'm a better one now. But I think that, that you know, the, the overall gist of being a cancer patient is never understood. You know, people call you warriors and they don't understand what that actually means. Um, and they also don't understand, like they don't understand the challenges that you face, they don't understand the battle, but they also don't understand how accurate that statement really is. I also became incredibly, incredibly honest. And when it's gonna suck, I'm gonna tell you it's gonna suck. And the reason why is sugarcoating it doesn't make it better. I do have some tricks though. I do know what you can wear into the PET scanner. I do know what you can wear for MRI. So I actually know all the tricks of the trade of like, and I know which contrast tastes better. Go for vanilla every time. Um, the berry's bad, orange is worse. You know, there's a lot of things that, that I couldn't actually speak to my patients about. And now I just get in trouble because I stay in my rooms way too long. Um, but what I, I hope that you guys understand is that is that you do have compassionate, kind, caring people here at Perlmutter, and we really do understand what it is to actually walk a mile in your shoes. And, you know, we have wonderful, wonderful resources. We have Catherine, who's just unbelievable. Um, and, you know, I think the world of her, she stops by my office every single day, practically just to check in on me and, and also to make sure that, that her patients are being cared for. You know, you don't need to be afraid when we will hold your hand. And I think that's all I'm going to talk about. Do I get to introduce Lila now? 
This is probably going to, I said I took way too long. I, I just, five minutes shorter than I was supposed to. Look at that. Whoever does that. Um, I actually specifically asked for the pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Lila Margillis. And the reason I did is because Lila is actually one of my patients. And I remember when I first met, met her and I told her about a patient that I had when I was in Calgary in my first job and she was a Boston marathoner and she's just an unbelievable woman. And um, she actually made me run my first half marathon because she came to me and said, hey, listen, if the cancer lady who just got chemotherapy and radiation can run a half marathon, so can you get off your couch? And she made me and her primary care doctor run a half marathon with her to raise money and awareness for lung cancer. And so I had told I had told um, Lila about this lady really early, and she kind of became this lady, which is kind of funny because there's these people that you come across as a physician that you never forget, people that really mark your soul and, and that you remember for a long time. And so Lila is that person. She's one of those people. And interestingly enough, um, it took a lot of bravery for me to stand up and go to my office with no hair, no hat, no anything, and just kind of embrace being like, this is who I am. If you don't like me, or if you think that I'm like, whatever, if you don't trust me because I have no hair because I'm going through chemotherapy, well, you know what? That's your ugly attitude. You're stuck with it. My hair's going to grow back. It's grow back better. Um, so I was walking down the hall seeing patients one day, and this lovely lady down the hall says, talk to me, show solidarity or something else and I looked down the hall and I'm like something else and she walked right towards me and gave me a huge hug and it made me realize that like that that the good that you do for people will always follow you and you know how lucky I am to have such f fabulous patients so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Lila tell her story but she's one amazing lady and deserves all the applause. Okay, now I'm crying and I have no eyelashes to absorb my tears. Um, another side effect of certain chemotherapies. Um, it's okay, it's okay, just let it run. Um, so I, I didn't prepare anything. Um, I'm just going to tell you my story. Um, so I, um, in 2016, I was um, developing this kind of anxiety about um, something being wrong with my lungs. And I had no symptoms. There was, you know, I went to my doctor. I said, we lived above a dry clearance at the time. And I said, I'm worried that I'm breathing in the fumes from the dry cleaners and I'm developing some sort of disease. And my regular doctor said, you're just anxious. You're fine. Your lungs sound fine. A couple months later, still having this nagging feeling, something is wrong. I went back. And again, she listened to my lungs. She said, you're OK. She did an EKG, I think, to appease my neuroses. I was like, whatever, attach something to me and try to figure out what's happening. And um, and then several months after that, the, the thoughts kept bubbling up. Something is wrong. And I had always been an anxious person, and I'd always grappled with, um, is this intuition or is this fear? So I called her at one point in uh, March of 2017, and I said, I know you think I'm anxious. I am anxious. I'm dealing with my anxiety, but I think something's wrong with my lungs please order me a chest x-ray or whatever it is that you do to look inside someone's lungs. So she reluctantly did. And, and then she called a few days later to say, so there's a gray area in the x-ray, but x-rays are really, you know, you can commonly see something wrong. So let's get a CT scan. Um, so I got a CT scan, and a few days later she called and told me that there was a mass in my lungs. Um, she's not my doctor anymore. <laughs> um, so I, uh, she referred me to a pulmonologist, and I, my husband and I um, walked up to 160 East 34th Street, 
and to see the Perlmutter Cancer Center. And I freaked out and I was like, cancer? I'm just going to a pulmonologist. Like, why am I walking to a cancer building? So I went and I met with Dr. Michaud, who was really excited to see my my scans. She was so enthusiastic about how small and how operable my mass was. And she said, you know what, this is amazing. I think you caught this really early. I think we can just take this right out. It's probably cancer, but it's really easily removable cancer. She was super excited about it. And I was trying to like pick up on this vibe of excitement about a cancer diagnosis. And then she introduced me to Dr. Crawford and said, this is the surgeon. And he was also excited. He's like, it's even in a really removable lobe. We can take the whole lobe out. It's just like, it's the extra lobe. You don't even need that lobe. So after like six hours of going back and forth to between them about what was about to happen to me, my husband Brian and I walked out feeling kind of like, okay, this might be okay. Um, so, you know, whatever Dr. Michaud was just talking about with like, the work that she does to not give you some terrible prognosis and not tell you your life is ending, but actually encourage you that you might be okay is very, is very true. Um, so I had the surgery, and afterwards there were some lymph nodes in my mediastinum, which I think that big bronchoscopy machine probably <laughs> found. Um, and it was staged then at 3B, not 1. Um, and I was given a prognosis, I think by accident at that point, because they kind of just handed me the pathology report, which wasn't the best move because I didn't really want to read all of that. But after that, I did not ask for prognoses anymore. Um, so then I was referred to Dr. Chichua, who is my um, thoracic oncologist. You know, any of you who are patients or any of you who have been around for here for a while and gone into his office, it's filled filled with elephants to a point that's it's kind of obscene. And I asked, what's up with the elephants? And he said, well, I just was collecting elephants. And then patients started giving them to me. And instantly, every elephant in his office was from a patient who was thanking him. And all those elephants were success stories or, or, or people who didn't survive, but their families thanking him for doing everything he could. And I knew I was in the right hands. And he was... He was firm and he was clear and honest with me, but he was encouraging. And he said, we can, we can, my intention is to cure you. Like this is a shitty disease to have. And my intention is to cure you. So I was like, okay, I, I'm like wrapping my brain around that. Um, and then I met David Mendoza, my nurse practitioner, who I totally love. He's been there with me the entire process. And now we sit around and talk about eating street food in Thailand and like other things, not just cancer. Um, so I had, I had chemotherapy. They wanted to, um, I was considered somebody who there was no evidence, not no evidence, there was no vi visible, uh, visible cancer, but let's do chemo and radiation. You're young and healthy. Maybe we can just zap anything that's possibly there. So I had um, chemo for 12 weeks. I had um, my hair did not fall out the first time. I had a different kind of chemo. I gave myself a funky haircut, but and then I just kept it. Um, and then um, I had a nurse whose name is Minnie, and I noticed in the chemo floor, um, not only did I have the same nurse every time who got to know me really well, and I got to know all the different gin she liked to drink when she was on vacation, um, but... They gave me a warm blanket. They did some acupuncture. They gave me a massage. Um, my mom, who's also here, who was in treatment for cancer at the same time at a different hospital, I won't mention the name, but chemo there was not so fun. And she came to visit me at chemo and was totally jealous. This is a spa. I don't understand what's happening here. And then we have Bonnie, who would come by with her comfort card and sit and talk to me for 45 minutes about everything and tell me all the best restaurants to go to. People, friends started asking if they could come to chemo with me, I think because they were having a good time at chemo. <laughs> um, at the end of the chemo, they do a celebration where you read a poem and you ring a bell and you're done and everyone claps for you and it's beautiful. Um, then I had radiation. I love Dr. Cooper. My radiation technologist 
um, was G this guy, Jamie. I was so nervous that they were going to radiate my heart because it was really close to the area that they were radiating. And every time I was like, just make sure it's lined up the right way. Like, I don't want you to radiate my heart. And he'd be like, yeah, I think it's good enough. He was, <laughs> so he, he got my sense of humor and he was amazing. Um, so a couple months after having a clear scan after all of my treatment, um, I felt a pain in my rib. And I called Chichua, and I was like, I got to trust my gut. And he said, you just had a clear scan. Go on your family vacation. We'll do, a, we'll do another scan in January. So I had a bone scan in January. And he called me when I was like in a tattoo parlor getting ready to get a big like bravery tattoo. And he's like, it metastasized your bones. So I didn't get the tattoo. One day, maybe. Um, so I had to start. Uh, new treatment. I went on a different chemo, a Braxane. He's like, your hair is going to fall out. I was like, I don't care about my hair. I went on a Braxane and Keytruda immunotherapy and pretty quickly everything stabilized. And then the, the, the bone mets, the metastases started getting smaller. And then there was only two showing up in the scans. And um, for the last, for the last, uh, almost two years. Um, it's been stable. Um, I started working with all these alternative practitioners doing he energy healing, um, herbs, supplements, qigong, like all these different things. And I always felt supported by my doctor, by Chichua, by David, um, by Dr. Michaud. I always felt supported by Dr. Ben Cooper, who's a radiation oncologist, who's a total nerd, and I was bringing him articles about him, taking all this this like glutamine powder to protect my chest from radiation. And he's like, okay, whatever, hippie. And then I had no esophagitis. And he's like, can you send me that article again? So I felt really supported in this alternative work. And I feel really vibrant and alive, even though I continue to have chemo every four weeks because of all the stuff I'm doing, because of all the love I get here. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm taking things kind of one day at a time. I have two young kids who they've embraced this like champions. I, I had a hat on at one point when my friend, my daughter's friend came over and she's like, mom, you can take your hat off. It's okay. So they're, they're in this with me and they see me for who I am. I'm honest with them that this is a really scary disease and that people can die from it. But here I am and all we all really have is now. Um, so that's my story, and I'll be here for questions if questions come up. And thank you, NYU. Thank you so much, Lila. We really appreciate you being here today and sharing your story. You're wonderful and very brave, and you have a great sense of humor as well. <laughs> and Dr. Michelle, thank you also for sharing your story and being here with us today. We will definitely invite you back next year, of course. <laughs> All right, moving on to our next speaker, we are going to hear about updates in medical oncology. So I would like to welcome Dr. Josh Svari, who is a medical oncologist here at Perlmutter Cancer Center. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Savari. I'm one of the medical oncologists in the lung cancer group, and I want to thank the, the organizers for inviting me and uh, for everyone here who's come out uh, to spend the day with us, and really to uh, um, Catherine. I mean, you, you do amazing work, and we really, really appreciate you every single day of the week. So what I'm going to really talk about today is sort of updates in, in where we are, and, and we all know this is a tough, tough disease, a tough illness, and uh, it's, it's folks like you who give us hope and, and give us the energy to you know, uh, hopefully study new treatments and, and bring new options to people that we see in the office. So these are my disclosures. I'm going to just give a brief outline. I won't really sp speak much about lung cancer screening, but I really want to use it as a segue of, of, of sort of, you know, how, how, you know, importance of um, identifying cancers early. Hopefully, the, if we can't cure late stage disease, maybe we can prevent late stage disease. Uh, I'll talk about the treatment paradigm in 2019 and really focusing on how much that has changed over the last five years. And we have lots of advances that are really exciting. And then I want to spend the most time on clinical trials, so new investigational drugs that we're actually studying and testing to benefit patients here at NYU. So as Dr. Uh, Michaud already talked about, early detection definitely saves lives. 
right? So at NYU, we were one of the first centers to start lung cancer screening back in the early 90s. And, you know, we have a very large uh, screening program, uh, both here and in Long Island, uh, hopefully starting now in Brooklyn as well, led by Dr. Michaud. And we've also been participating in uh, biomarker testing, so early clinical trials to see can we identify uh, cancer early, not just by imaging, but by other biomarkers in the blood. And as we all know, this very large cancer prevention type study or lung can cancer screening study has led to a 20% reduction in mortality in lung cancer. So who should be screened? And this is very, very important as a sort of public health announcement. It's all people who are age 55 to 79 or 77 who have smoked in the past uh, and at least have a 30-pack year smoking history. So we have a robust program here that we had already mentioned. So this is a very common sort of theme, right? Smokers get lung cancer. So just a, a, a raise a hand in the audience. Is this true or false that only smokers get lung cancer? Okay, good. That's important. All right. That was not the case in 2013, 2014. So this is a very important uh, um, Lung Cancer Alliance uh, sort of uh, advertising program uh, back in 2012, showing you that all people can develop lung cancer. The only thing that you need to develop lung cancer is to have lungs, okay? And it's important that, you know, when we meet a patient, whether somebody was a smoker or a non-smoker, there are different treatment options, but we don't judge, right? We treat every single patient the same in the sense that, you know, we wanna make this disease into a chronic illness, right? We wanna make this a disease that people can live with for long periods of time. And we also wanna to try to remove the stigma around this disease, right? You all know that breast cancer funding, for example, or prostate cancer funding is extremely high because there is no stigma related to those cancers. Lung cancer, similarly, there's nothing that people did to deserve this cancer. And across the board, we have to sort of end that stigma. So it does not discriminate. So let's move into treatment. So how do we think about the treatment of lung cancer? And when we think about treatment, stage is really important. So can you guys all hear me? So stage is where did the cancer start in the body and where has it gone? So a stage one lung cancer, and Dr. Michaud explained earlier, that's a cancer that starts in the lung and stays in the lung. So it has not involved any other lymph nodes. And Dr. Michaud and our other interventional pulmonology colleagues are critically important in this, in this setting because they help us understand whether cancer has spread to other lymph nodes that are in the middle part of the chest. We also obviously look at imaging and other modalities. A stage two cancer is a cancer that starts in the lung and may have spread to one lymph node locally in the area, whereas stage three um, is a cancer that has spread to lymph nodes that are in the middle part or mediastinum. Now, early stage lung cancer, stage one to three B, is essentially curable, and the treatment is different from what we're gonna talk about next, which is stage four. So stage four cancers are when the cancer starts in the lung and it spreads to another part of the body. In that setting, we think about the cancer as not curable, but treatable, and we have lots of good treatment options that are available. So in 2015, this is what existed for stage four lung cancer, a cancer that started in the lung and spread to another part of the body. We had chemotherapy as a first line option, as the first option for patients, and when chemotherapy stopped working, we had another type of chemotherapy called docetaxel, or a second line option. And really, that's what we had in our armamentarium. That's what we were offering uh, to patients. Thankfully, a lot has changed in the last five years uh, with the advent of immunotherapy, with the, the advent of targeted therapies, um, we now have a very, very sort of large discussion with all patients that we meet in the office who are diagnosed with a stage four lung cancer. So this is a list of all the approved drugs in 2019 in lung cancer, and you can see it's a very large list. We're working very, very hard to study and learn about new drugs that can help our patients. And highlighted here in yellow are all the drugs that have been approved in the last four to five years. So you can see about 70% of the drugs are new. So we're working hard and we're doing a lot of work to try to better treat this disease and hopefully in the near future cure it and get rid of it. 
Now, how do we do this? How can we, how can we do this? How do we, how do we test and study new drugs? Well, this is really all through clinical trials, and I'm gonna talk a lot about those today. This is a slide from the FDA for recently approved drugs. It's about a year old now, but we're doing pretty good in lung cancer. I think we could do better, and I think we need more support, more funding, but also I think as a community, as a group, we need to speak up for ourselves more. So how can we better connect people with treatments that will improve their lives, right? So it's not like in 2015 where every person who we meet in the office gets one chemotherapy regimen, right? We really try to personalize the treatments now. So how do we do that? So the first thing is genetic testing. Now, has anyone had genetic testing in the room? Raise your hand. And when I talk about genetic testing, there's two types of genetic testing. There's genetic testing of the cancer itself, and that's not something that you likely inherited from mom and dad and have a risk of passing on to your kids. And then there's genetic testing of the actual tumor, right? What did I acquire from the environment over time? We call the difference between those two germline. Germline is what you inherit from mom and dad. And somatic is sort of what you acquire from the environment. There are lots of somatic alterations in lung cancer. And it's very important to understand what the genetic alterations are in the lung cancer because it helps with prognosis. But more importantly, it helps understand what treatment options are available. So this is a pie chart looking at about 4,000 people who have lung cancer and showing you the distribution. So EGFR uh, being one of the more common. I just wanted to make sure that you made a comment that this isn't, it's not this stable throughout their entire Correct, genetics can change, and also people can develop resistance to different medicines, and we'll talk about that in one of the clinical trials I'll present. But EGFR and KRAS are by far the most common alterations, and I wanna talk about two trials that are addressing those patient populations, but you can see there are many small slices of the pie, ALK, ALK, or you know, BRAF or ROS1, it's critical to understand what alterations patients have because then we can actually tailor specific treatment to them. This is a really important slide. This is 100 people diagnosed with lung cancer uh, in 2019, and this is the distribution, right? So the folks that are sort of highlighted in a box there, the treatment should be different than the folks in different, uh, and, and what you see there in, in red and, 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 and in the gray there is the different histology or subtype. So Gaetan, you were Dr. Michaud, you were explaining when you were in uh, med school, you talked about lung cancer, and then it really split to squamous cell and adenocarcinoma, as well as you know small cell, which is a separate entity. But I think what we're understanding now is you can dig deeper than that and understand genetics to help drive correct treatment options for patients. So how do we do this? So when, when we study new drugs in the laboratory, right, we're actually testing drugs on cells, animal cells that have cancer or human cells that are then sort of studied in the laboratory. And you can see here, you have lots of drugs that start out in the beginning, okay? Lots of you know, candidates or preclinical work. And then those drugs move into what we call the phase one setting. Has anyone been on a phase one study or heard of a phase one study? That's when we're testing new drugs or new options uh, for patients. And as you see, unfortunately, lots of drugs are studied in the lab, but only a few make it into phase one. And then through the system, phase three is when you actually study a drug versus a standard of care. And that's actually what will then get approved by the FDA if it's successful. And it takes many, many drugs and not you know, few that get approved down the line. So it is very important uh, to participate, A, but B, for us to, to, to sort of study these drugs in the right patient. So what we want to do is we want to keep this you know, not as tight. We want it to be a lot of drugs approved here. And the goal is if we study the right drugs in the right top population, we might be able to move better options or better treatments for patients forward. So let's talk about some of the trials that we have open here. And this is just a small smattering. So immunotherapy, anyone had immunotherapy in the room? Raise your hand. So immunotherapy was probably the biggest thing to happen in lung cancer in the last five or six years. Immunotherapy are medicines that do not kill cancer cells, interestingly. Chemotherapy is infused in the vein and kills cancer cells. Unfortunately, it also kills normal cells. Immunotherapy revs up your immune system to better recognize and attack the cancer. 
Unfortunately, it also can have some side effects, right? It can have autoimmune type disease. Has anyone seen or known anyone outside of cancer with a history of autoimmune disease? So autoimmune disease is just where immune, your immune system revs up too much and might attack normal tissue in the body. And we're actually trying to cause that sort of scenario in the body. We hope not to cause autoimmune disease per se, but we do want the immune system to recognize and attack uh, the cancer cells. So pembrolizumab or Keytruda um, is now the standard of care in the frontline setting for folks who are newly diagnosed with lung cancer where we do not identify a genetic alteration in the tumor. Um, unfortunately, immunotherapy or Keytruda works for most patients, but not all patients. So what are we doing to better understand different types of immunotherapy? So this is a drug, NC318, uh, that's been studied here at NYU by Dr. Jeffrey Weber, and we're part of the study in the lung group, part of our phase one drug development group. And you can see this is really cutting edge, right? This was presented November 6th. Uh, at the uh, Society of Immunotherapy Conference, right? So these are new drugs that are being uh, thought about and, and, and tested. So how does this drug work? So it's a different drug than a PD-1 or a Keytruda type medication. This is a drug that works completely on a different pathway in a different way. And here you can see a patient who has lung cancer, 48-year-old patient who developed non-small cell lung cancer and unfortunately progressed or had their disease that grew on immunotherapy or Keytruda. And after getting this medicine, the NC318, uh, uh, developed vitiligo. Vitiligo is when your own immune system reacts against your melanin or your cells in your skin that produce color. And this is actually a very early sign that the immune system was revved up and was recognizing things that it wasn't recognizing before. Um, this patient happened to have a response uh, to the treatment. This is another patient on the study, a 74-year-old gentleman with non-small cell lung cancer, also who unfortunately had progressed on prior immunotherapy. And you can see here at baseline uh, the size of the mass, uh, and then followed over time, the patient had a 71% regression in the size of the cancer. Thankfully, this treatment has been well tolerated thus far on phase one studies, but importantly, we need to then study this in phase two at a correct dose in more patients to better understand. So I think that the idea of a clinical trial is often very difficult and, and tough to think about. And I do think that if there are available options that are standard, it often is easier and better to choose those. But when there are no other great options, I think thinking about a clinical trial might be a good idea. I want to then talk about targeted therapy here for a moment. So targeted therapy is different uh, than chemotherapy, right? Targeted therapy is really focusing specifically on how do you block individual abnormalities in cancer cells? So I want to just shout out a few groups, the EGFR resistors, the ALK positive group, the Ross Wonders, and the Exxon 20 group. These are all patient-run advocacy groups who have done more for oncology and more for the targeted therapy patient population than I myself or my colleagues have done in the last five or six years. I was actually just at a conference this past weekend that was hosted by the EGFR resistors, and they were patients in the room who had EGFR mutant lung cancer who were fighting back and saying, why do you design your clinical trials this way? Why does the FDA require this? And I think collectively, if we voice our feelings and our sort of, you know, what we want for ourselves, I think we can make great, you know, sort of strides in the field. The EGFR resistors group has even taken it one step, you know, further. They have a Facebook group that's closed. There are 2,000 patients on the group all across the country, and they discuss the disease. They discuss different trials. They discuss side effects, right? So they collect data and publish it. So we have a real-world experience for Tegriso side effect profile that we didn't really have from our clinical trial database. Very important data that I now hand out to my patients in the office. They've also partnered with academic labs to study their own tissue. Right? So they're collecting biopsy material from their own biopsies, right? standard biopsies that patients have. They'll donate part of that tissue to a laboratory to then be implanted in mice so that we can study new drugs and, and move the field forward more quickly. 
So unfortunately, in, EG, in the EGFR space, the standard of care right now is a drug called Tegriso, and it works very well. But inevitably, most people develop resistance over time. Uh, it takes about two or three years uh, where the cancer is sort of outsmart uh, the medicines, and sort of like what Dr. Michaud was saying, you might have one mutation up front, but over time, you can develop resistance. And this is a drug, JNJ372, and I'm a, one of the investigators on this study, where we're looking at studying this drug in folks who have growth of the cancer on the Tegriso. So as you can see, um, we've made much progress over the last five or eight years now in this disease in that we have three different generations of EGFR inhibitors. Uh, the first, anyone hear of EGFR ever? Have anyone heard of it? Okay. Does anyone have EGFR? I'm just curious. Okay, cool. So, so if, if, if someone has an EGFR mutation, right, they might have had an earlier generation drug like uh, Tarceva or Orlotinib, um, and at the time of progression might have gone on to a, a newer drug like Tegriso. Now we're studying newer drugs than that to try to prevent resistance or to deal with resistance over time. So this is a patient actually treated here at NYU, a very interesting gentleman from China who was treated with a first generation, one of the very early versions of an EGFR inhibitor back in China and did pretty well for about 12 months. And unfortunately, at the time of progression when he developed resistance, he was able to come here to the US and was treated with Tegriso or Osimertinib. He was on Osimertinib for 26 months, which is sort of what we would hope or expect. And at the time of progression, he developed this rare mutation called C797S. And this drug, the JNJ372, has activity against that alteration. And you can see his scans from baseline, uh, and then cycle four means four months later, with a 68% reduction. I saw him in the office about a week and a half ago, and he's on cycle seven, so seven months in, tolerating the medicine well and actually having very, very good quality of life. So back to that point of it's really important to study specific drugs in specific patient populations where we think that we have the highest chance of seeing activity and benefit for our patients. KRAS, has anybody heard of KRAS? Okay, so KRAS is the most common mutation in cancer across the board. If you look at lung cancers, I showed you that pie chart of 25%, but actually if you look at the entire U.S. population, it's probably upwards of 30%. Now, the, the, the problem with KRAS, and here, here's that, 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 that figure that I had mentioned, the problem with KRAS is it's been very, very hard to target. So for the last probably 10 or so years or 15 years, we've tried multiple drugs, multiple combinations of targeted therapy or pills, multiple combinations of chemotherapy. We've even more recently tried immunotherapy and have not been very successful in blocking KRAS uh, because it's a very hard pocket, right? It's hard to get a drug into that pocket. In 2014, a lab, a laboratory studying human tissue from patients who donated their cancer cells to the lab, studied a specific KRAS G12C, so it's a subset of KRAS, and were able to show that they were able to fit a specific drug into that pocket. And over the last three years, that led to the development of multiple compounds in this space. So there are currently three KRAS G12C inhibitors that are being studied in clinical trials. We have two of them open here at NYU. Uh, AMG 510 and MRTX 849. And, and again, we've seen data from these compounds presented at conferences now, um, one of them at ASCO, which was in June, and one in Barcelona at our European Society of Medical Oncology two months ago, showing that these drugs work about 50 or 60 percent of the time in patients who have KRAS G12C who have progressed, unfortunately, on multiple other lines of therapy. So what we're doing is we're trying to better understand these drugs, these compounds, and we're trying to move them forward, right? Because these drugs are small molecules or pills are way better tolerated than chemotherapy or even immunotherapy for that matter. And getting it to patients who need it would, would, would be, that's our goal ultimately in, 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 in what we do. So I don't work alone. We have a very large group. Obviously, you see Dr. Michaud. This is an old picture. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to update it. I apologize. <laughs> no, you can't update it. That, that is actually my profile photo. Okay, yeah, so... Says, That's not you. <laughs> Got it. But we have a huge group here, and we're very fortunate. I'm very fortunate uh, to work here. Um, we have a very large uh, um, medical oncology group. 
Uh, we have a, a phenomenal interventional pulmonology group. Uh, we have surgeons, and you guys are probably looking at this saying, I know this person, or I was treated by her. So, and, and, and a huge and, and very broad range of thoracic surgeons as well. Um, you know, recently we've started working more with other disease groups as well, right? So rheumatologists to help us deal more with the autoimmune disease, uh, more with our pulmonologists to better understand inflammation in the lungs. So it really does take a village. So I thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, we'll hang out. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabar. That was really informative. All right, moving on. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Elridge Proctor. She is the Senior Director of Government Affairs at the GOT Foundation for Lung Cancer, which some of you probably remember if you've been coming for the last few years, the Lung Cancer Alliance. She's going to give you updates and talk to you about the name change and fill you in on all the exciting initiatives that are going on there. So let's welcome Elridge. I'm just going to take a moment to adjust the mic, so hopefully you don't need to see me as much, but you can look at the screen. Um, thank you to the organizers of this event for inviting me here. It is actually my first time, and I'm pleased to be here. And thank you all for coming. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Elvich Proctor. I am the Senior Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Uh, formerly, we were known as Lung Cancer Alliance uh, through a recent merger with the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. Uh, we are now Go To Foundation for Lung Cancer. Um, and as you see on the screen, we we'll tell you a little bit about Go To. It is still an organization that's founded by patients and survivors, and the organization uh, has been merged for, I think it's about seven months now. Um, give or take or so. And our mission is simply to transform survivorship by saving, extending, and improving the lives of those vulnerable, at risk, and diagnosed with lung cancer. And um, our tagline, excuse me, just to make sure this is working okay for me. Just click out of the box. Got it. Great, sorry about that. Um, so our tagline simply says that we will empower everyone and ignore no one. And we do that through our promise that we will work to change the reality of what it is to live with lung cancer by ending stigma, increasing public and private research funding, and ensuring access to care. And I think one of the ways to really talk about what we have been able uh, to do in the policy space um, is to go through our uh, impact uh, to date. So let's talk a little bit about what we've done in policy. So as you will see, uh, back in 2008, uh, the GoTo Foundation helped to establish the first ever federal research funding pipeline for lung cancer within an account known as the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. So all I'm simply saying is that GoTo helped to establish federal funding that is provided by the United States Congress, and it's a program that is administered by the Department of Defense, where we now have a lung cancer research program for over 10 years now. Uh, GoTo also established a, fra a research framework on lung cancer at the NIH. This was done through a piece of legislation that we co-led uh, with the pancreatic community, and the historic legislation is known as the Recalcitrant Cancer Research Act of 2013. When it passed, it actually resulted in what you see now as the small cell lung cancer research that's being done at NCI. As you all might be familiar, um, screening has always been at the forefront of our work in terms of establishing early detection for the community. Uh, so GoTo did lead what was probably over, but I'm going to say about a 10-year effort to successfully secure lung cancer screening as a fully covered preventive service for the millions at high risk. We've also established what um, the community has come to uh, um, take part in, which is an annual national advocacy summit on lung cancer in Washington, D.C. This is where we convene uh, newly diagnosed patients, survivors, caregivers, medical professionals, and uh, friends in a, a two-day summit on lung cancer where we discuss issues uh, that are impacting us. And then we uh, participate in direct advocacy on Capitol Hill. Um, and we hope to be holding our next summit in June of 2020. Um, 
the go to has also established something that is not um, widely known, um, but some of you may be may be familiar with, which is the first ever bipartisan congressional lung cancer caucus in the House of Representatives. This is a way of having um, champions on Capitol Hill who will not only address the issues of lung cancer, but be willing to bring it forth between the body to discuss it and to address it in the congressional setting. And we as the organization uh, continue to lead a congressional briefing series with the caucus. And then what I'm gonna talk to you more intimately about is our introduction of the Women in Lung Cancer Research and Preventive Services Act. Um, this is a legislation that GoTo is leading nationally. Something to think about is that when, as we unite here and across the country to acknowledge Lung Cancer Awareness Month, we must also remember what that commitment and what that stands for. And as you will see on the screen, when November 2006 was designated as the National Lung Cancer Awareness Month, it was to reaffirm the commitment to advancing lung cancer research and early detection with the goal of significantly increasing that five-year survival rate to 50% within the 10 years. It was to working with all federal agencies to develop a coordinated plan for accomplishing that goal. That has always been the goal of the GoTo Foundation, continues to be that priority today, and the congressional intent behind the legislation, the Women in Lung Cancer Research and Preventive Services Act. A lot of times I do get asked, why is it only focusing on women? It is actually a strategy to increase research. It is not meant to exclude, um, but there are recent studies that are revealing higher incidence in not only younger women, but never smokers. Also, let me just say this too, um, as we think about strategies, I think we need that. We need to employ out-of-the-box thinking to explore ways to address the disease in ways that have been unaddressed, unmet. Quite frankly, I can boldly say it is old and tiring news to our community that um, funding for lung cancer lags behind other cancers. And so we're working to achieve that in whatever means uh, where we find op opportunities to do so. And so let me talk to you about the legislation. First, I think it's widely known, we all uh, are familiar with the lung cancer facts and figures, and it continues to be that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in every racial and ethnic subgroups, and it is the leading killer, cancer killer of women. We've estimated that 181 women die each day from lung cancer. If you're keeping time, that's one death every eight minutes. This makes lung cancer a women's health imperative. A common view that lung cancer is self-inflicted by smoking, which of course doesn't help former smokers or current smokers, but that thinking is being proven false as smoking rates are going down, but yet we're still seeing a higher incidence of lung cancer, in particular women, younger women, and never smokers. And so that tells us that we have a gender gap in our understanding of lung cancer, and so we've got proposed legislation that will allow us to look more into this. And as I mentioned earlier, there are studies that, are now, that have been shared, that have been reporting higher incidence of lung cancer in women. So I'm gonna share two with you, which is really for us what got this started. So it put the ball in motion in crafting this legislation, the Women in Lung Cancer Research and Preventive Services Act, was a groundbreaking study in 2010 published by Brigham Women's Hospital, which revealed to us that not only was lung cancer the killer in the US, but also a killer among women. And at that time, their data was showing that nearly 200 women died each day, and that most of them died a year within the diagnosis. But yet, lung cancer remains maybe a hidden secret, uh, something, an issue that's not talked about often, and where still a lot is unknown about it. And as we know, it, again, it lags behind in federal funding. And so the report really was calling, was issuing an action on this issue. It was issuing an action to bring lung cancer out of the shadows so that we could do exactly what we're doing today, uh, raising awareness about the issue and doing it in a national capacity. 
Then in 2016, Brigham and Women's Hospital updated its report calling lung cancer a women's health imperative. And it was then that um, the, the, uh, the foundation now uh, uh, drafted the first legislation um, introducing that bill in 2016. What was profound is last year, um, we also received the report of significant finding of higher incident rates of lung cancer among women, which was documented in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the study um, was conducted by American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute, with the authors themselves concluding that not enough is known and that more research is needed to look into women and lung cancer. And so for us, we see this as opportunities as we are working to unveil the incidence of, of, of lung cancer in women. It will also allow us to um, come to understand more about the gaps in other populations and other settings as well. So as I shared, this is really, through the enactment of this legislation, is really a vehicle to accelerate research into the, a deeper understanding of lung cancer. Um, this is just a timeline that I'm really not going to spend time to go through it, but just some key highlights I'll share with you is that um, you know that the legislation was introduced in the past Congress. It did not pass, and so it is pending now before the current Congress. The opportunity here is that it's been introduced within the first session of this Congress, giving us enough time to build the momentum to advance the legislation. And we are rallying behind National Awareness Month this month to really see key advancements in the legislation. And we're inviting the community to join us in making a lot of noise about this. Um, also significant is that with, uh, within this opportunity uh, to have the reintroduction, we've also uh, been endorsed by the ACS CAN and 17 other organizations, which congressional sponsors were very glad uh, to see as support is building up for this bill. Um, to talk about the legislation itself, um, let me just share with you what the bill does and the bill number. So if any of you wants to look it up, it is uh, reintroduced as uh, um, in the Senate as S-1107 and in the House as H.R. 2222 uh, by our Senators Rubio and Feinstein. They have been lead with us since the beginning, and I should say they each have a connection to lung cancer personally. And Congressman Boyle, who also became the new chair of the Congressional Lung Cancer Caucus uh, this time around, and uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick, both from Pennsylvania. And the bill also picked up five original co-sponsors um, Senators Capito, Manchin, and Representatives Bonamici, Dingell, and Rutherford. So these were additional members who said, we agree, we strongly support this, and we're going to join you in reintroducing and leading this bill. What the legislation does is requires HHS to conduct an interagency review to evaluate and identify opportunities for increased research on women and lung cancer, improving access to preventive services, and a national public awareness education campaign. So this is really talking about coordination of work among the federal agencies so that they're no longer working in silos, but then coming together and evaluating what's been done and what needs to be done. The legislation truly communicates more dollars needs to be um, invested in lung cancer. It doesn't have to, the bill itself does not specify dollar amounts. It does require the agencies to uh, spend their own allocated funding which is good because then they get to identify where the priorities are and they get to review what they've already done to see what needs to be expanded upon. And it also prioritizes the work that the federal agencies are currently doing in lung cancer as they're being authorized to do more. And then thirdly, um, it again brings a more comprehensive and coordinated pl plan to reduce the impact of this disease overall. Um, one of the things that I want to share with you all is that it's always been our dream as uh, previously as Lung Cancer Alliance and as GoTo to make sure that there is a more um, comprehensive way of addressing lung cancer. As we've seen in past, the focus has heavily uh, been on prevention, but that has been in silo. And now we want to bridge prevention with early detection, as well as research, research strategies in the continuum of care. And so we really see this as a platform to continue to connect the dots where there are gaps and misunderstandings. 
Um, what I'd really like to do is just, um, if it's appropriate, is really invite you, the community, to share with us in advocacy uh, regarding this issue. Um, there are a number of ways that you can participate. Um, as um, you can go onto our webpage, I, I know you all may not be familiar with GoTo, but it simply is that um, go to foundationforlungcancer.org. And you'll find a lot of our fact sheets and informational documents. Some of it are included in your packets today. I think you have a New York specific uh, state fact sheet. And um, you also have um, specific facts on women and lung cancer also included there. And I've left my business cards on the table. But we do pr uh, provide an easy platform where you can send pre-written letters to your representatives. Um, as individuals, you have the right and the opportunity to email your members of Congress and to tell them about what's important to you. And on our website, we have um, uh, an engine that allows you with just a click of your mouse to be able to send that message to your representatives. It will locate them, find them, and email them. As um, representatives of institutions, we would welcome letters of endorsements for this bill um, or your support of the issues. Um, and then what we've called this campaign has simply been Save Her Lungs as a way to, to, um, to get people to resonate that we are working on the Women and Lung Cancer Initiative. But again, it's not meant to be um, exclusive. It is inclusive of the entire community. And the hashtag that can be used is simply that, um, hashtag Save Her Lungs. So I thank you all for this opportunity and I welcome to, uh, any questions that you all may have. But again, thank you. Thank you so much, Eldridge. We really appreciate you coming here all the way from DC. And every year, you guys are so supportive and always willing to come and share your updates. So we thank you very much. OK, and last but not least, I would like to welcome Catherine Pakin, who is the Stephen E. Banner Fund Senior Social Worker at Perlmutter Cancer Center. And she's going to talk to us today about the Supportive Services Program. So let's welcome Catherine. I'm so pleased to be here and see familiar faces that mean so much to me and and new faces. And thank you, Rachel Elridge, Dr. Michaud, Dr. Sabari. It's really, I'm really privileged to be talking here with you today. Probably the apex of what I do, where everything that I learn that I know comes from is a group of people that are self-chosen in a way and also interviewed to come to the group that help each other. They share, as Dr. Michaud was saying, what works, what doesn't work, how do they get through treatment. And they also act as a de facto advisory board for not just myself, but Dr. Wilshashua will say to me, what, what does the group think about this or that? And they really care for each other and um, help each other through this journey. Once a month, we have speakers. And here's an example, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Michaud. We've also had um, origami, uh, art therapy, and a host. Uh, we had a cardiologist come. The group will tell me what they need to learn about, what they want to know. We have a newsletter that Here's an editorial board of um, patients and family members and a couple social workers thrown in that help find the, the information to put in it. Um, Lila has written an article for us. So it's all, you can see some examples there. Now, two years ago, it, some of you were here, we had at this meeting a play that the support group wrote and acted in. And they invited the audience to learn more about their support group and join it. And it's so much fun to be back here again and remember that. And I was very privileged this year in Arizona at an oncology social workers annual meeting from with social workers for, in oncology from all around the country to present about the play. Here is an ex a picture of the, the patients act, uh, practicing, rehearsing the play. And the 
patients in the group that were not in the play were outside the play giving direction and advice of how to do the play. And they did the, the scenery too, which you can see in the back. And here in Arizona, you see social workers acting as the patient. We did a reading of the play, and it held itself. And one of the main messages of the play was, let's get rid of the stigma attached to lung cancer. Let's um, get more, you know, more awareness for lung cancer. And it was timeless. It held up. When this social workers read it, it felt like it was happening again, and I think it, it'll... It'll hold, it's classic. One of our nurses had the idea at the play to hold up these signs, and this is just an example of me with, this, with the signs we held up. Caregivers are very, very important for lung cancer patients, and we are starting a caregiver group that will be meeting on Fridays, and this will be open to um, family, friends, of people who have lung cancer that need support themselves, which often they do. So call me about this. Actually, Lila started this. She first w walked um, in a, for, to raise money and awareness for lung cancer research. And a year later, Perlmutter Cancer Center set up our own team. And we ended up having 175 walkers and raised over $50,000. And here's just a little bit of us, okay? A few more of them. <laughs> and this is a segue for me to talk about our volunteers. You see Lila there, but she's with one of our volunteers, and we're so privileged. You know, besides the oncologist, the pulmonologist, and advocacy and legislation is so important. Thank you, Elridge. But in addition, we have dietitians, we have pharmacists, um, and we have volunteers. And our volunteers have been trained to help social work in, a, in um, helping patients fill out applications for transportation, accessoride, and for meals, God's love we deliver, as well as they do their own thing. So we're just very thankful for our volunteers. And here's another one of our volunteers. And I heard, uh, I heard a rumor, this wonderful volunteer, that she is, is she your aunt, Rachel? My friend's aunt. Your friend's aunt, okay. <laughs> but um, we're just very delighted to have our volunteers, too. So thank you for listening and coming. This is just a, a small f fraction of what we do, but um, I'm delighted to join the panel and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for all the great work you do. Um, yes, as Catherine mentioned, we are going to take some questions now. So I would like to invite our panel speakers up to the front. If you have a question, as I mentioned in the beginning, you have index card inside your bag. Just jot down your questions on there, and I'm going to come around now and collect them. So just raise your hand if you have a question. You know, we never know if you're a good candidate for a surgery until we actually see your scans. 
we look out, we get some tissue, find out if we can get there, etc. But you know, even a lot of these technologies can be used even to, to put dye into your tumor and let it leach out to the surface. So if the surgeons are going to operate, they can see it and they can just take out that small piece. So there's a lot of really interesting things and a lot of innovations that are happening. And how we I did things 20 years ago, it like it actually seems archaic to me now. So uh, there's a lot of hope in the future to be able to get to things even more so. But yeah, something that's three centimeters, even if it's out of the periphery of the lung, that should be accessible. And so it's a really good question. So first one is, is there any research on non-KRAS G12C, so other KRAS entities? And the answer is yes. Uh, so there is a G12D inhibitor that will enter the clinic, uh, hopefully in the next uh, three to six months. Uh, lots of work being done in G12B as well. Uh, so we have preclinical uh, drugs in the laboratory, uh, but again, a little bit further off. Um, and, and again, ARES is sort of a broad field, and, and each specific mutation uh, has to be sort of targeted or blocked in a different way. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about or ask that question. The next question is, there is squamous cell carcinoma involving skin cancer or involving the skin. How does that differentiate, or how is that different from lung cancer? That's a phenomenal question. So the squamous cell cancers can actually happen multiple places of the body, the same way that adenocarcinoma or gland cancers, those can happen in lots of different parts of the body. So it's the cell type that becomes abnormal or has a mutation or abnormality. So squamous cell cancer of the skin is a skin lining cell became abnormal or cancerous, and that is not, that's different than a, a squamous cell in the lung that became abnormal. Uh, so that's really the, the difference between the two, and, and they're not generally related to each other. Uh, I like this question. For patients with less than 30 pack year histories of cigarette consumption, how do you factor in cigar uh, and pipe smoking history if possible to get the current screening? So a really great question. I will tell you guys, so there's a fudge factor. So in order to be in compliance with the CMS, we have to actually screen within the guidelines of like the pack years. Uh, up to 90% of our patients have to fit those criteria. So if you've been a heavy pipe smoker or, or a heavy um, cigar smoker, there is like not a, a way to kind of judge, but if you are, I get to be the fudge factor. So I get to decide who gets those 10% slots. Um, and so people that are higher risk, we actually, we actually do screen people outside of the guidelines. Um, other people that we're like starting to really look at and it kind of is along with the, the, the go-to initiative, um, we're, we're really wanting to do two things, two big projects moving forward with screening. So one is tagging people's lung cancer screening with, um, uh, with their mammography. Because women go for the mammography, they don't go for the lung cancer screening. So we're gonna try to do a one-stop shop you go for both at the same time, and and then that way we actually make sure that people are in compliance. So that's one thing, it's one initiative. The second thing is is that we're actually really, really interested in high-risk women. So, you know, as you guys know, or you may have heard, that, you know, Asian non-smoking women actually tend to have a large number of adenocarcinomas, and they actually have that they happen to have EGFR mutations. And so we want to find a way to actually target that population with respect to some of our screening initiatives because we feel that those people have a higher risk. The other, the third, the third group that we're actually really interested in, and it's something that you guys probably saw of my, my little thing is I'm personally extremely interested in 9/11 exposure, and so we've been actually collecting data on people's 9/11 exposure now for four years. I guess I've been here four years for four years. And, um, and so every single patient that comes into our offices, we ask about their 11 exposure because we also feel that those patients actually have our higher risk. And you know, if we take lessons learned from asbestos, it took 30 years to develop cancers related to asbestos, like somewhere 25 to 40 is sort of the range um, between the lining cancers and then the lung cancers. And so if we're looking at 9-11 at exposure, we're sort of starting to just start to see an increase. Um, and I think that we haven't hit the peak of that, but I definitely think that we're gonna see a lot of cancers related to 9-11. And, you know, unfortunately, if you look at the number of people that are actually on the World Trade Program, there's, there's an estimate of being about 450,000 people that were exposed, and that you could have one big exposure and be down at ground zero at time at the first day, or you could have been down there recurrently in the first six months. 
And the thing is, is if you can prove it and you have a cancer, like that's a big deal. It's a, it, you know, you can actually be on the World Trade Program. I'm going to pass the microscope to the left on that one. It's a microphone. You're such a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I was pointing at myself because um, Dr. Michaud actually asked me if I was around um, downtown after 9-11, and I hadn't considered that, but I was, and I was working um, not right at Ground Zero, but um, within the range, and so I did apply, thanks to you, and I qualified for secondary health insurance, and now I'm going through the application process. Um, to apply for what could be two hundred and fifty or three hundred thousand dollars, just like a lump sum of cash, um, and having a cancer diagnosis just gives you that amount of money. Um, so it is, I think it is something that's really important to to look into. Um, so um, I was handed this card. It feels like a doctor should have this card, but I'll I'll try my best. Um, the question is, can you differentiate? Clear, cure, remission, and stable. Um, I think I used a bunch of those words, so maybe that's why you handed me the card. We'll answer it too. Just okay. It's an important thing that gets thrown around all the time. Yeah. So, so I, so my understanding is that um, I think in some of the medical slides, there are only certain cancers that, in terms of lung cancer, that can be cured. And so I think if a cancer is very early stage as um, a, a solid mass in your lung that can be removed and there's no other cancer in the body, that that could probably be identified as cured. Um, and we're just talking about lung cancer here. Um, clear is if there is evidence of cancer and then you have scans and nothing shows up in your scans, I think that would be considered clear. Um, sometimes I, I also hear that as no evidence of disease. Um, which I think is also a similar word to remission. So if somebody with lung cancer is in remission, I think they're showing no evidence of disease. But my understanding is that many, most of the, a lot of the time with lung cancer, there is a, a recurrence um, like likelihood. And so instead of calling it cure, you're calling it remission. Um, and then stable is when I think you're seeing cancer or something like cancer in the scans consistently and it's not they're not changing. So if you have a mass and each time you get a scan, the mass is the same size, your scans are stable. Then you okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions is do you have pain management doctors that have chronic post op surgical site pain for my lobectomy? So it's not uncommon to have pain, uh, both neuropathic or nerve type pain, or, or chest wall or muscle pain. So we do have pain management doctors in the office. Uh, there's a whole group of pain management doctors, a total of five of them. Uh, we recruited a new nurse practitioner as well, who's phenomenal, so I looked at very, very closely. So whoever asks the question, feel free to reach out at your next visit to whatever whoever you see in the office, and we'd be happy to put you in touch. Any other questions from the group? Um, I do feel the card left. I'm just getting ready to write another one out. Thank you, Scott. Same, same. And question for you. Are you able to tell, oh, I'm sorry, please go. No, she was just giving a point. Oh. <laughs> Are you able to tell through either a CT scan, a PET, or an MRI, I've had all, whether there's too much scar tissue to have a back surgery, or do you only really know once you go in? So it's a good question. I mean, sometimes we see a lot of scar tissue, and like if we look at the scans, and there there really is way too much. Like, but the 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 proof of the pudding is always when they get in there. Oh, and they also have severe um, thoracic scoliosis. Does that affect any type of lobectomy or wedge infection? Scoliosis won't affect it. They, I mean, you're positioned in the operating room with your side that they're going to operate on up and. You know, there's a lot of things with that, so, but we can manipulate you a little bit better when you're in the operating room. The only things that you have to be careful of when you're thinking about patients that have spine issues is that sometimes the lungs can actually have, have can get scarred at the bottom parts, and there can be some things related to the scoliosis itself. And one of the things that we strive for as 
as people that intervene on the chest is we really want to try and make you better. We don't want to make you worse. So, you know, there's often trade-offs, and, and I gave a talk the other day at uh, another meeting, and we talked about trade-offs. And, you know, one of the big jobs that I do is I actually evaluate my patients and look to see how good are their lungs, and can they tolerate what we're actually asking of them. And, you know, it's really important to know that trading off having a cancer versus, like, becoming a, a lung cripple and not being able to roll out of bed and, or roll over in bed not a great option. So we really actually, it's really important to have a pulmonologist on your team to be able to actually look and, and help with that decision making about are we going to make it worse? Are are we going to cause trouble? And, and I can tell you, I mean, just yesterday in the clinic, Dr. Shishu came into my office and he said, can I give this person immune therapy? They have underlying lung disease. And, you know, we actually have what's called a pulmonary toxicity clinic. So we actually have a clinic that I run on Tuesday afternoons that all we do is we look at did the drug cause problems? Or did your drugs cause problems? Did your radiation cause problems? How do we treat it? And they, we try to optimize your lungs. And we also try to see people early to say, you know, maybe that's not the best choice. Maybe we should go down a different pathway. So I, I think that every person's scar is actually individualized. We really have to see the scans to be able to know. Um, but the real answer is truly when they get in there, whether they can actually take things off or not. Yes? Oh, oh. Does diet play a role with lung cancer? Like if somebody's eating too much red meat, what they say? So it's interesting, it's very controversial. We, we don't think in 2019 that diet plays a role in, in lung cancer. Um, you know, as opposed to colon cancer, for example, where we definitely know there's a correlation or a connection. Uh, lots of work is being done now looking at the microbiome or the different bacterial sort of uh, flora of the lining of the lung. Uh, so I can't guarantee for sure that diet or, or what you sort of inhale or, you know, it matters or not. But I, I don't think in 2019 diet matters. And to, to go on that point, a lot of times when people are diagnosed with lung cancer, they very rapidly change their diet to, you know, cut out any red meat, to cut out any carbs or sugar. There's a big thing about sugar on the internet. Um, I really advise against that. I think eating a very healthy and balanced diet, uh, actually not really changing much, is more important than you know all of a sudden becoming vegan or or you know or such. So I think maintaining weight, uh, especially for folks who are getting treatment, is critically important. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Uh, uh, are you aware of, of, of uh, people getting tubular and interstitial kidney damage from uh, PDL1 checkpoint inhibitors? And, uh, and so, what, is, is, do you have any about it? It's, it's a very specific question. I'd be happy to talk about it personally. But yes, immunotherapy can cause both tubular and interstitial. What that means is there's different parts of the kidney. And what we talked about, immunotherapies are not specific drugs for a specific cancer. What they're doing is generally revving up the immune system to better recognize and attack cancers. So what they can cause about 5 or 10% of the time is inflammation in other organs of the body, and the kidneys being one of them. Um, so it is difficult. Uh, it depends on how severe it is. Uh, if it is severe, I'd recommend stopping the immunotherapy. Uh, but again, we can talk about it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Okay, and we are going to wrap up now. So let's thank our panel of speakers for an amazing program and all the work.